our next speaker I'm quite fond of, obviously. Um, Dr. Derek Cabrera, uh, you'll see in his bio that he is a well-regarded scholar and expert in systems thinking and cognition. Um, he's also my academic colleague and my husband. I can tell you that he has a fascinating background. He would love to tell you anytime in a bar anywhere, probably. Um, but that does include many experiences in nature, which actually ironically led him to systems thinking. Um, as a former mountain guide, a mountain climber, all in the a lot of the world's highest mountains, which he won't brag about, but I do, um, starting an orphanage in Nigeria and all the way down to coaching 10-year-olds baseball and basketball teams. So he's a well-rounded human being and an impressive academic. So without further delay, Derek Cabrera. Thank you. Well, I'm um, glad to be here, glad we finally made it through the two point something inches of snow. Um, uh, I want to start off with just a fantastic talk by Mr. Fishman. Um, Think Water is a portmanteau between thinking and water, uh, so uh, really appropriate to have sort of the water part and then now the thinking part. And Mr. Fishman astutely uh, mentioned in his talk the sort of invisibility of water and how um, that tendency for us to take it for granted. And I think a lot of those kinds of, a lot of those kinds of sentiments can be applied to thinking as well. Thinking is one of our most important human assets, and yet because it's so prevalent and so all the time, we often take it for granted and it's often invisible to us. Um, and like water, Great thinking is all around us, but getting the right thinking in the right place at the right time sometimes uh, is where we miss, miss the boat. And systems thinking really fundamentally is about making thinking more visible, even though it is completely all around us all the time. Um, and um, one of the big parts of that, as Laura mentioned, my, my influence really came from nature as a mountain guide. I spent most of the first part of my life 300 or 320 days a year in the mountains. And um, so I was really influenced by nature and I think nature does have the answer. And if we listen close enough, it usually will uh, be teaching us constantly if we're paying attention. So um, I'm here today to just give you a little background on systems thinking and um, uh, just generally about our lab. We, we kind of focus on basic research and we also fo focus on innovating tools and technologies because one of the things about systems thinking is you know you can learn the concepts but really diving in and practicing them with with tools or technology is the best way to learn it and then finally public understanding for the same reasons that we have to get the word out there about water we have to get the word out there about thinking and we have to make sure that that word has high fidelity to the research but also is accessible and translatable and and um, uh, simple enough for, for, for the general public to understand. So getting back to nature, I mean, uh, one of the things uh, that the military uses to describe the real world or the natural world is this, this term called VUCA, which is, uh, just means uh, volatile, uh, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And I don't need to tell you too much about the VUCA world because you live in it every day and you understand it. It's a it is a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous place. Um, the problem comes in that a lot of our thinking and a lot of the influences of our thinking, even 2,500 years back to Aristotle and the Plato's of the world, is uh, not as much VUCA as it is a, a technical term we use, LAMO. And that means uh, linear, it's not a technical term, uh, linear, anthropocentric, mechanistic, and ordered. And what I mean by that is, is simply that while the real world is nonlinear, we often think in very linear ways. And while the real world is almost entirely agnostic to human endeavors, the mountains really don't care, the, the nature really doesn't care much about like how we view the world, um, we tend to look at things through our uniquely human-centered or anthropocentric lens. And while the real world is incredibly adaptive and organic, we tend to think mechanistically we use metaphors to reference machines. We, we talk about the universe being a clockwork, which it's nothing like a clockwork. And we talk about the mind being a lot like a computer, which it's nothing like a computer. Um, the real world is also networked and complex. And importantly, it has a little sprinkling of randomness, which throws everything off. And so uh, we tend to think about things in very ordered, uh, 
and categorical and hierarchical ways. And so this mismatch between a VUCA world and sort of this lame thinking um, needs to be reconciled. And that reconciliation is the purpose of systems thinking as a field. It, systems thinking really tries to align our thinking with the real world. Um, if I was going to sort of take systems thinking as a discipline and, and, and reduce it to a bullion cube of understanding, what I sometimes call a PhD in a quote, uh, this is the quote. Wicked problems result from the mismatch between how real world systems work and how we think they work. And if we can get better at aligning this mismatch, uh, that, that is the promise and, and the popularity of systems thinking fundamentally. And one of the first ways that we can get better at this is understanding one of our most core biases. There's, there's hundreds of different types of cognitive biases in the world, but there's one that, uh, that I call the mother of all biases, which I call reality bias. And that reality bias is simply that we experience the world every day as if we're experiencing it directly. When we experience the world, when we wake up, we think if, if the, what we see is, is what's happening. When the sun rises, that's what's happening. The sun is rising, even though that's not actually what's happening. So we experience the world as if we're experiencing reality directly, but in reality, what's happening is we're sp experiencing the world through a veil, which a veil of our mental models. So everything we're experiencing is our mental models, which includes lots of our bias and all that, all that kind of stuff packed into those mental models. And those mental models can kind of throw us off track. So I'll give you just a few examples of mental models and their power. This is how we might think a system works, let's say an organizational system, an org chart or something like that. We think in terms of a nice hierarchy where you know, happiness declines as you get lower in the hierarchy. Um, but in reality, or in a slightly better approximation of reality, maybe it looks something a little bit more like this, which is very nonlinear. There is still hierarchical aspects, but there's also nonlinear and non-hierarchical dynamics and influences between people, numerous relationships, et cetera. And because of our incredibly long room, I realize um, you probably can't read that, those little things. But these people all have kind of like social dynamics going on. Um, here's another example of uh, one of our tendency in mental models. So one of my favorite comments say, what's that mo mountain goat doing way up here in a cloud bank? Our mental models are so powerful that even when reality, even when nature gives us feedback that they're wrong, we often just make them right. And that's called, uh, that's, that, that's a, a very strong bias where we sort of make the picture fit our mental model. Um, and of course, that, that, that mountain goat isn't sitting in a cloud. <laughs> this is another great example of a mental model. See some uh, the beasts. You can see the power of a mental model. Now, whenever I'm giving a talk and I drink water, I always, I always think of Marco Rubio, and I, it's very, or, or else Donald Trump. Like, you know, so you have to be very careful drinking water as a presenter now. Uh, but there are mental models all around us, right? I mean, everything, everything around us is a, is a representation of somebody's mental model of things. You're, the chair you're sitting in is, is our representation, our mental model of how the biomechanics of, of sitting works. And these are mental models as well. The one on the right you're probably very familiar with, Barbie. That's a mental model, and it's a mental model that has influenced generations of young boys and young girls about the the idyllic feminine form. And it turns out that she's uh, not so idyllic, not even real. Uh, this one was a, based on a CDC report. This is called Lamely. And this is the average dimensions of a Western 19-year-old girl. And um, this was a Kickstarter project. And, and I, I remember supporting this project. And I got the doll in the mail. And uh, we have two daughters, teenage daughters. And when, when I pulled the doll out to show them, we were kind of excited. And they both said, she looks kind of fat. 
And she, it, you know, the reality is she's not. Barbie is just a unicorn. Barbie is not, uh, Barbie's not really like a, 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 a rarity. Barbie is not real. And um, if you look at the actual statistics and the ratios of Barbie, it shows that she's not real. If she, if she existed as a human being, she would walk a little bit more like a Quasimodo than, than like you'd think Barbie would walk. Her head would actually snap off of her body because her neck wouldn't be able to support its size. Um, she would snap at the, the ankles because those aren't real either. The shoe size that she has doesn't exist. Um, and, and lots of other sort of Im improbabilities in terms of Barbie. So our mental model is just wrong. It's fundamentally wrong. Uh, and, and getting the right model sometimes looks uh, strange, strange to us. Our mental model of what it means to fight like a girl or what it means to be an Army Ranger just recently changed with um, Lieutenants uh, Shea Haver and Kristen Greist, who recently, from West Point, who rec recently passed the Ranger School. So that changes our mental model. Our, our mental model gets feedback from the real world and it changes what we, what we think. This you're probably familiar with from the movies. This is a velociraptor, right? And it's very sort of lizard-like. Well, we just recently found uh, a, a new, a new um, specimen in Mongolia that has little bumps uh, on the parts that we found that, that are associated with uh, feathers. And so we now know that, that if we were going to have a mental model of a velociraptor today, it looks a little bit more like this, more like a bird uh, than a lizard. And, uh, and this has changed all of our thoughts on, on certain species of dinosaur and what they actually look like. So the, uh, the basic idea or the basic algorithm of systems thinking is the same algorithm, believe it or not, for human learning, science itself, and actually, uh, if you just change the words a little bit, it's the same structural algorithm for evolution. And what it is, is you have a mental model or a schema, and that mental model approximates the real world, some piece of the real world. And then, importantly, the real world is giving us information or feedback so that we can adapt our mental model. And if we go around the circle enough times, our mental model becomes a better approximation of the real world. And one of the things that, that's really critically important about systems thinking is deconstructing what this mental model is made up of. Because as we get feedback from the real world, which comes in the form of information, what we do cognitively is organize that information, structure that information. And in, in, in common terms, that's called thinking. Uh, in scientific terms, that's called metacognition or cognition. We're structuring that information to make meaning out of it. And the ways that we structure information are both biased and can also help us to be less biased. And um, there, there are four sort of fundamental patterns to how we structure information to create meaning, which are the mental models that approximate the real world. And so if we just sort of summarize this as a simple equation, it just says simply that mental models are made up of information and thinking. And you can think of mental models synonymously with knowledge, ideas, concepts, theory, science, meaning. You can think of information as synonymous with data or content. And you can think of thinking as synonymous with cognition or structure or organization. And so I just want to walk you through four of the sort of fundamental patterns of how we do this thinking stuff to make thinking a little bit more visible to you. And these are the four rules, the four patterns that we use. And I'm gonna, I'll go through each one, but it's, we sometimes call it DSRP just because I am not terribly creative with names of theories. Uh, so it just stands for distinction, systems, relationships, and perspectives. And one thing I'll just put out there is uh, while this might be new to you, some of these terms which this, these four things, these four cognitive patterns lie at the basis of are probably not new to you. So you, you I'm sure, heard of critical thinking or creative thinking or design thinking, uh, content mastery, becoming a master in, in content and understanding, systems thinking, interdisciplinary thinking or scientific thinking, thinking like a scientist, those are very important. And also things like emotional intelligence and pro-social intelligence. Those are all underlying, th these, these four patterns underlie all, all these types of things that are very important in the real world. Uh, an example of which is emotional intelligence, for example, requires perspective taking to have any kind of empathy or compassion. So empathy and compassion are, are molecular and perspective taking is atomic to, the, to those molecular structures. And one other th point that I'll make before getting into these four patterns is uh, 
Uh, a lot of folks sort of say, oh, well, maybe I'll adopt those four patterns. You don't have to adopt them. You've already adopted them. You've been doing them since before you came out of the womb. You've been making distinctions, organizing things into groups, relating things, and taking perspective. It's more, uh, it's more being aware of it. And in science, we call that metacognition, which just means being aware of your cognition, being aware of the places where you tend to have bias, uh, being aware of the places where you can think beyond. Uh, uh, Mr. Fishman talked a lot about... Uh, uh, the, the pattern of these four folks that he mentioned, I, ca I can't remember all their names, uh, but the pattern really is that they kind of expanded their context and they took perspective. So, you know, knowing that, that we tend not to expand our context and we tend not to take many perspectives, that can unhinge that bias uh, uh, that we tend to do. So I want to just show you this video really quick. The systems that you are part of and that you care about are complex. They're made up of many independent and connected parts, and they're adaptive. Their parts are constantly adjusting, refining, converting, integrating, based on what is happening in the world around them. The study of complex adaptive systems, or CAS, can help us understand the world and think in new ways to solve problems. For centuries, we looked at complex systems like these and wondered, how do they work? How do millions of birds collectively flying in one direction turn in an instant and all begin flying in another direction? Initially, we assume that it must be the result of some amazingly efficient leadership structure where an alpha bird of some kind gave crystal clear directives to the flock. We soon learned that there was no leader. There were only simple rules that each bird followed according to what its nearest local neighbors were doing. Remember, there is no leader. No bird has overall command and control. There is no global scale awareness of the whole system. It is just a whole mess of birds and a few simple rules that they follow. What we are seeing is a remarkable phenomenon called a superorganism, a system that is made up of hundreds, thousands, or even millions of individual organisms, but that acts like it is a single organism. We can learn a lot about how to design and implement complex adaptive systems from the experts, from nature, things like ants, birds, and fish. Here's an example of simple rules leading to complex behaviors in a human system. Simple, but with a big effect. All human systems are complex adaptive systems too. We are independent agents following local simple rules leading to emergent complexity. Sometimes it can be hard to see the rules but they are there. And if you understand them deeply, you can see that they are amazingly simple. This is a, um, this is a, a pretty big development in science that started around in 1980, around there in, with the Santa Fe Institute and a number of Nobel award-winning physicists and chemists and things like that, that, that looked at uh, how to look at complex systems. And, and what they found was that underlying complex systems, which are a lot of the systems we care about, actually underlying those systems are simple underlying rules. That simplicity is not the opposite of complexity, but it's the driver of complexity. And this is a critically important idea because when we think about thinking, um, our brain and our, our, you know, the thing that our mind, which is the brain and body connection, um, is a, is a very complex and adaptive system. It might be one of the most complex and adaptive systems that, we are, that we're aware of. And it's hard for folks to, to conceive that something that is the most complex and the most adaptive could also be based on very simple underlying rules. That's kind of a, like a, a paradigm shift that we don't expect. Uh, for 2,500 years, we expect that something that's very, very complex would have things that are very complicated underneath. But it turns out that these complex systems are actually just lots and lots of individual agents that are interacting based on simple rules, and that all those many, many, many dynamical interactions lead to what's called emergent complexity, 
And so when we think about thinking, when we think about how would we capture the most complex of complex systems, uh, we, we don't typically think that it can be simple. And so we distrust the simplicity of, of, these, of these kinds of systems. But it turns out that these simple rules underlie very, very complex knowledge networks and complex networks of, of cognition. And these are the simple rules. So we can first sort of think about distinctions that nodes, some node can represent any concept or idea or thing or people or groups of people, really anything. And then another rule is simply that any node can be related. So this is the relationships part, uh, distinctions and relationships. Any node can be related to other nodes. So we, we, we can represent those, let's say, with, with lines like this. And it, the, you can also not have relationships. And um, the next simple rule is a very important one, which is any one of those relationships can actually be a node in and of itself. And this is critically important because when things are related, they're, they're related by other things, other, other physical things. And the, fine, the, the next rule is simply the systems rule, which is any one of those nodes can have a whole set of parts to them, right? It can be a system in and of itself. So, and that system underlying that one node can be as complex or less or more complex than the, than the whole system that it's a part of. So that's a very simple rule. And then finally, and this is a, or ne uh, next, final, next to final, what is that, penultimate, um, is that, that any one of the nodes can be a perspective. And this is critically important because if you think about how systems behave, they don't behave based on some God view understanding of the system. They behave based on their agent's views of the system. So even though the agent might not fully understand the system, their agent behavior will be based on their unique and limited and biased perspective. And so the behavior of the system will change based on the information and the understanding that's available to those individual agents. And finally, that, that any node in the system is actually uh, distinctly related to all the other nodes in the system in that the way that it gets its identity is not only from itself, but also from the things it's with. And that's essentially distinction making. And so underlying this very, very complex thing we call cognition and systemic cognition are really, really simple rules. And so all we're sort of saying from the, you know, the, it's great that it's World Water Day and they've chosen, the, the answer is in nature, because it really is is that we can look at these natural systems and we can see that, yeah, there's this amazing complexity going on, and yet it's really just these two little birds interacting with each other based on these little simple rules that they have. And what we're effectively saying is that we can do the same thing with ideas of any kind following four simple rules, and that those can lead to massively complex knowledge networks or massively complex systems understanding, et cetera. And so let's just go through the four rules real quick so you have a little familiarity with them. The distinctions rule is simply that any idea or thing can be distinguished from other ideas or things it's with. And you're constantly making distinctions. This is critically important. Uh, they're, they're often plagued with your biases, and unrefined distinction pollutes everything downstream. And seeing new ways to make the most basic distinctions often leads us to new discoveries. So, Here's a, an example of a distinction that we make in, in visual illusions, right? This is the face example and this is the vase example. In the face example, you're, you're seeing the identity, the white spot as the identity, and the black part is not a vase, it's just not face, right? And when you see the vase instead of the, the face, the black part is a vase, it's a thing, the identity, and this white stuff is just not not vase, right? It's the other. So all distinctions fundamentally are made up of this sort of identity other uh, interaction, and that helps us to challenge our distinctions. Now, which, which circle, which uh, orange circle looks bigger to you? The right one? It looks bigger. Yeah. So this, this is one of our biases, our visual biases. They're, they're actually exactly the same, right? But what this tells you is that our distinction making is not the, the identity of the circle, the meaning of the circle that we take is not just based on the circle itself, but the other things that it's with. And this is the case for all things. This is the case for your own identity. Your identity changes based on who you're with. So this is the case for the identity of atoms and the identity of people and the identity of circles. The identity of all ideas has this fundamental identity other structure to it. 
This is one of my favorite t-shirts. There are two types of people in this world, those who can extrapolate from incomplete data. So we fill it in, right? We, that's how distinctions work. Your brain already does this. We fill in the other, we fill in the identity uh, when we need to. This is uh, an example uh, in, in 2006. These are some of the smartest planetary scientists in the world. And they're in Prague discussing the distinction, what is a planet, the, the definition of a planet. And believe it or not, this is the moment when uh, Pluto got voted off the island as a, as a planet. And so we make distinctions all the time. Sometimes those distinctions are made for us by nature. And sometimes we make them up. We, we, we find some anomaly that doesn't make any sense and we don't have a model for it. And so we take a vote and we make a distinction. And so those distinctions are happening at social levels, at individual levels, at micro levels, et cetera. This is an important graph if you're afraid of bears because it gives you a very clear distinction of where the danger area is and where, where you're safe. Um, and so distinctions aren't the thing itself. The distinction is a boundary. A distinction is a fence between what something is and what it's not. So here's the safe zone, or the, these, this is the safe zone, and this is the very unsafe zone. And what do you think that is? Ketchup? Ketchup? Pepper. Pepper? Yeah. So your brain is just, it's a distinction-making machine, and you'll, you'll sort of search for lots of micro-distinctions to try to identify what it is. It's actually the um, top of a Coke bottle, right? So when we widen our context, when we widen our view, we, we can see more. What do you think that is? An ugly-looking thing, isn't it? It's an old French fry. An old French fry. It does look like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it's amazing what the brain does, right? I mean, an, an old French fry, like what a distinction, right? We're, we're just distinction-making machines, right? And, and we search for anything that can sort of help us understand. I mean, old French fry kind of works, right? But it's actually, the, you know, the, the, the uh, stem of an apple, yeah? And so, you know, fundamentally, we can make the distinction bird, and that's a, a very general distinction, but... We can also know that uh, we can zoom into that distinction and find many, many, many more distinctions, which each have their own common and scientific names. But one of the things I want you to notice is that as we make this, this massive amount of distinctions just around the single distinction bird, and each one of these you could find experts that know so much about just that one little distinction there, what you'll also notice is that when we create knowledge, we tend to start grouping distinctions, don't we? Right? So we tend to systematize things into groups. And we even give those groups names. So the groups themselves are distinct groups from each other. So we're making distinctions at the group level, at the individual level, between scientific terms and, and popular terms, et cetera. And that grouping is just a part whole function. And that's what systems is all about, the second rule. Any idea or thing can be split into parts or lumped into wholes. And Importantly, your brain groups stuff, period. It just does. And how you group it matters, and we often get it wrong, and getting it wrong can be costly. And alternatively, if you're aware of that, then new insights are gained by organizing things in very different ways. So just getting, when you get something grouped a particular way, like a hierarchy or a category, you can just question those things because they're almost always wrong or maybe only right in certain contexts, right? If you look at most taxonomies in science, they turn out to be wrong. We have a long history of taxonomies that turn out to be invalid scientifically. And in science, we often say that there are two types of scientists, splitters and lumpers. The, the splitters are those who break stuff up. Uh, they're sometimes called reductionists. And then the lumpers are people that, that integrate things together. They're sometimes called holists. And in this new world where things are very, very complex and we have lots and lots of wicked problems, we need a new kind of scientist, which is a splumper. Uh, somebody that can do both. We, d we don't need the war between reductionism and holism anymore. We need splumpers who can do both. And that's just part whole, part whole structure. And of course, that, that part whole grouping and chunking, that happens across numerous, numerous levels of scale. So it's happening horizontally and it's happening vertically in scale across all knowledge systems and cognitive systems. This is one of my favorite ads from uh, 
lows. And this is how you should, if you're a splumper, you can go through the world like this. Just everything, everything explodes into parts, and the parts explode into parts. Cool ad, isn't it? Look at that. And there's one part where they have a fish, but they don't explode the fish. <laughs> that would be cool. Like right, right there, wouldn't it? Not like blow them up, but like just like take them apart and then put them back together. It's all CGI anyway. It's not hurting a fish. No fish were injured. <laughs> okay. And of course, everything has parts. And some of those parts, the distinct boundaries of them are real. You know, there's the Mississippi and obviously naturally real boundaries. And some of them, we just make it up. We just go, yeah, let's make it a square. And of course, we can zoom into any one of those parts, and it has parts, and we can zoom in further, and we can see lots of new parts. These are gerrymandered parts, right? <laughs> These are just literally the manipulation of part whole. And you know, so something very, very complex like gerrymandering actually is reduced to something very simple, which is just the manipulation of part whole. This is how it works fundamentally. You can take 50 people, 60 and 40 in red and blue, and you can break it up like that, three and two in blue wins. Or you can break it up like that, blue still wins, but different part whole. Or you can break it up like that and just change the, change the whole result, right? And that's just the manipulation of part whole systems, very important cognitive function. And of course, this whole thing leads to this, which is a pretty big deal, right? So something as complex as this influential body and all of the influences it has can be reduced to a simple manipulation of part whole structure cognitively and just creatively coming up with insane part-whole structures. Relationships are all about just when we put two things together, we can relate them. Believe it or not, if I'm a marketing expert, I can put two things in front of you, like Coca-Cola and love, Coca-Cola and life, Coca-Cola and friendship, and pretty soon you're going to relate them. And I can make you relate them without your permission, right? If I just keep showing them to you long enough, I know how your brain works. I know you'll relate them if I keep putting them up together, and pretty soon you'll be like, friendship, Coke, I need a Coke. I'm thirsty, right? So this is how relationships work, and often without your permission, they, to test the validity of these relationships or conclude, you'll, you'll uh, definitely conclude some silly things. And remember also that nature hides most of its secrets inside of relationships. That is why it's so critically important that we not just relate things, but distinguish them and then zoom into them and see them as the systems that they are. Because if we just take two things and say they're related without zooming into that system and understanding it as an entire complex system itself, then, then we lose a lot of the hidden stuff in nature. This is one of my favorite quotes by the great biologist Lynn Margulis and Dorian Sagan, who was Carl Sagan's son. Life did not overtake the globe by combat, but by relating to each other, by, by interacting and relating and creating, forming partnerships of symbiosis. And relationships compound on each other, and that's how we get unintended consequences, right? Things we don't expect. In 1950, this is a, a obligatory cat parachuting um, thing that I think all, all presentations should have. Uh, in 1950, now there is a purpose, I promise. Uh, in, in 1950, in Borneo, um, they had a malaria outbreak. And so they did the, the causal linear thing, which is to spray DDT and kill the, the vector. So uh, what they did was they, they sprayed DDT, the, the malaria went down, right? What also came down were all the huts, the, the, the roofs of the huts in the villages. They all fell down too. Nobody could figure that out. But it turns out that it had killed, um, the DDT had also killed the vector for the mosquito that, or for the larva that attacked the moths. And the moths, of course, eat the roofs. So there was more moths. So you got more roof eating and more roof falling. And um, what also happened was the cats rubbed up against where they sprayed the DDT and then they licked it off their fur and then they died, which increased the rat population, which led to bubonic plague in the human population. Right? So there's a lot of different relationships in that system happening and a lot of unintended consequences. And uh, what they did was they took a bunch of cats and they parachuted them in and reversed that equation to uh, you know, remedy the situation. So seeing the relationships are critically important. And finally, perspective taking is that simply that anything or idea can be a perspective or a point of view. And you're essentially one big biased perspective taking machine as a, as a human. And if you change the perspective and you change the distinctions, 
the groupings and the relationships you see. So when we say changing perspective, we shouldn't just think of it as like, oh, you just shift perspective. When you shift perspective, what actually is happening is you're shifting the distinctions that you're making, the relationships that you're seeing or not seeing, and the way that things are grouped or not grouped. Um, I don't know if you've heard this in the news. It's a pretty busy news cycle, but uh, turtle crime is ex on the extreme rise right now. They had a, a, a snail was mugged by a turtle the other day, a gang of turtles, actually, it turns out. And when the police came, they asked the snail what happened, and the snail said, I don't know. It all happened so fast. So this is something that your brain does. You take perspective. You wouldn't laugh at that joke. Uh, without, it, without your permission, your brain took three perspectives or that joke wouldn't be funny, right? It took, in order to understand that joke, you have to understand the perspective of speed in, for a snail population, a turtle population, and a human population. And that's what makes that joke funny. So your brain's doing this stuff without your permission. And of course, perspectives change the distinctions we make. When we take our perspective, we see things in a totally different light, we describe them in different lights, and uh, we end up you know, creating lots of us and them types of situations, et cetera. This one's kind of a funny perspective taking. They're both screwed. Uh, and and we, we do develop tools, which I'm not going to talk about today, but what these tools allow you to do is sort of take actual perspective and see the thing as differently. So we change the distinctions, we change the organization, we change the relationships when we change perspectives. And these tools allow us to actually model and map perspectives. And this is a, a tool that we've been developing in our lab, a software that, that, that is now uh, out in the world. So importantly, what you should remember is that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And um, so challenging the way you see things is critically important. And finally, I'll just wrap with this idea, which is that you know, systems thinking is this critically important thing. Uh, what we've learned, what Laura and I have learned in our lab and studying people doing systems thinking and things like that, uh, is that one of the best ways to learn systems thinking is to, to map, to visually map. And there's a bunch of reasons that I'm not going to go into about why visual mapping works for our particular brains. Uh, but if you want to learn systems thinking, there's lots of concepts out there that you can learn. But fundamentally, what we've learned over the last decade is that the best way is to dive in and start mapping and practicing the mapping of ideas. Um, and so we've developed these tools that, that help us do that. And then that can lead to things like systems leadership. How do you apply systems thinking in organizations? And if you uh, want to learn more about these kinds of things, we have two books. One's called Systems Thinking Made Simple. One is just out called uh, Flock Not Clock. This is on systems leadership, and this is on systems thinking. And, uh, and then the tool is uh, Plectica software. And that is it. That's systems thinking made simple. Yeah.